All right, hey guys, how's it going? It's your brother Noah. I hope that you're blessed, and I'm really excited about this video because the Lord's been showing me some revelation about this particular scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, this video is going to be called, When Will Pastors Wake Up and Kick Sinners Out of Their Church? This is something that I see 90 to 99% of congregations and churches not doing, or they're not kicking people out of their congregation. They're not defellowshipping people that are continuing on in their sin, that are calling themselves brothers and sisters, they're calling themselves Christians, but they're continuing on in their sin. And uh, this is just going to be uh, really eye-opening for you guys, hopefully convicting, and will help you to realize that you should not be fellowshipping with, you should not be yoking up with people that are persisting on in their sin. And uh, this can help you guys to examine the ministries that you're a part of as well too, to be like, am I a, a part of a ministry that's just allowing hordes of unrepentant sinners that are committing willful sin that are calling themselves christians and and the leadership in my congregations just allowing these people to continue on in that's the question you need to ask yourself because when 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 leaderships allow people that call themselves christians but are living an abomination of a lifestyle they're living in so much willful sin when those, when those leaders allow those people to continue on in their fellowship, the devil gets a legal right to operate through those people and operate through those children of Satan even that much more. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we see this principle really laid out uh, in the New Testament. And uh, I guess we'll read it now. It says in verse 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you, uh, from among you. So Paul is saying that they're having the ba a bad reaction about this, that these people that are in this fellowship with this individual who had sex with his, uh, with his father's uh, wife, with his dad's wife, they are not mourning that this individual should be kicked out of the church. They should be seeking God and getting ready to kick this person out, but they're having the right wrong reaction and paul even says in the next verse verse 3 i think it is for i verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though i were present concerning him that hath done this deed him that hath done this fornication this wicked sin this willful sin in the name of our lord jesus christ when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our lord jesus christ to deliver such a one unto satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. So he's saying, I'm not even there physically, but this guy did such a terrible sin that I don't even have to be there physically to judge that this guy should be kicked out of your congregation, that he should be defellowshipped. And that's what he's saying right here. To deliver such a one unto Satan, Paul is saying this guy needs to be defellowshipped so that he will come to a genuine repentance, that the devil will tear him apart so that he will come to a genuine repentance because it's actually hindering the person who's in sin, oftentimes, it's hindering them from repenting if you allow them to continue to fellowship with you, because then they're thinking, well, all these disciples of Jesus Christ are fine with my willful sin, ultimately. I'm still able to fellowship, and they, they kind of hide, they camouflage themselves even sometimes in Christian fellowship in order to try to make their conscience a little less seared. You know what I mean? They are trying to use the fellowship as a means to escape their conviction and not actually repent. And for people who are not repentant, they need to be defellowshipped even quicker. You know, there's a difference you need to judge between somebody who's a babe in Christ or somebody who's bound by a demon that's genuinely trying to overcome, uh, but especially with a person who's unrepentant, you know, you rebuke their sin and they come up with some cheap grace doctrine or they're showing zero signs of repentance, that shows that they need to be defellowshipped even the quicker and more sternly, right? So you can judge it based upon, you know, is this person actually genuine repentant or is this person just stone cold? They don't even care that they're living in sin. And as well, too, you know, if they've been continuing on in that sin for a long time, uh, you know, there's a difference between that individual and somebody who's seeking the truth, somebody who's a sinner who's actually seeking out the truth. There's a difference between that person and a false brethren that's crept in unaware. But it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 5, 
Your glorying is, is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that uh, ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us not keep the feast with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. So Paul's rebuking the Corinthians yet once again for keeping company with fornicators. He's saying, I already wrote to you guys once about this to defellowship fornicators, to defellowship these people that are living in this sin. But now he has to rebuke them yet once again. And this is definitely something that has not been taken very well in the church, at least in, in modern times, that people are not defellowshipping people that are living in sin. And uh, it says right here, know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If you are allowing people into your fellowship, if, if leaders more specifically are allowing people into their fellowship that are living in sin, that gives the devil a legal right to operate through that child of Satan e even that much more. This person who's continuing on in sin and is trying to cloak themselves in your fellowship is a hidden agent of Satan. He's masquerading as a child of God, but really he's just a twofold child of the devil and he's going to corrupt the fellowship. I've seen it before where people allow willful sinners that call themselves Christians into the fellowship, continue on in the fellowship. And then since the leaders are disobeying the word of God, that gives the, the devil even that much more of a legal right to operate through those children of Satan. And that's very important to understand. It goes on to say, not, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters for then must need ye go out of the world but now i've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or an extortioner with such a one not even to eat so if somebody's calling themselves a Christian with one called a brother, that's somebody who's calling themselves a, a Christian, if they're living in these sins, he's drawing the principle, if they're living in willful sin, you're not even supposed to eat with that person. And other uh, translations translate some of this to say not even to associate with that individual. Some of these people need to be defellowshipped hard. Not so that you can be hateful towards them. Not so that you can be maliciously angry towards them. But in hopes that, one, that they will actually repent. That will help them to repent. And as well that your congregation is not polluted with uh, false doctrine and uh, just with, with sin in general. You know what I mean? Uh, it goes on. To, oh, and I wanted to explain as well, too. It says, uh, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or covetous or extortioners or idolaters. He's saying uh, people get more leeway if they're not calling themselves a Christian. You know what I mean? You can reach out and uh, you can reach out to people more so with uh, people that are not calling themselves Christians. If you were going to completely stay away from everybody, even people of this world that are not calling themselves Christians, you would have to completely go out of the world. That's how demonic and sin stay in this world is but what he's saying is there's a higher level of accountability when somebody's trying to mix in with the congregation and they're living in their willful sin uh that person you're not even supposed to eat with is what the bible says and i'm taking this principle more serious in in my life in my walk i've read through this verse before i've read through this passage before but god's really just revealed it to me in such a deeper way recently in my life and also as i've been reading throughout the scriptures and i just praise god for that uh i have a fellowship that i do uh bible studies with and I've been kicking people out that are that are living in their willful sin. And uh, I think it's really been a blessing because I could see how if I disobey that scripture, the devil is going to be able to use those people to pollute the fellowship. And you don't want to allow the fellowship to be polluted for the sake of not offending people, for the sake of just, you know, not offending people, right? Uh, that's very important to understand. It's the most loving thing to do to defellowship these people. Now, yes, you could still reach out to them. You could encourage them to overcome, but don't yoke up with them, especially if they are unrepentant. Um, let's see. I wanted to read a uh, psalm. I wanted to read Psalm 26, 4 through 5. It says, I have not say, sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. There's many churches, church buildings that are just full. It's a, it's a congregation of evildoers. And they're actually that much more evildoers because they're calling themselves children of God. They're calling themselves representatives of Jesus Christ. 
yet they are not obeying Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? So David's saying right here, I'm not going to uh, sit with those people. I'm not going to sit with vain persons. And let me tell you, somebody who's masturbating and they say they've been a Christian for years and years and years and they're unrepentant is a vain person. And you do not want to sit with that person. He's saying, I've hated the congregation of evildoers. Even the assembling of those people together is something that brings distaste to me, something that angers my soul. And that should be the case for you guys as well too it does not matter how much they call themselves a christian it does not matter how much bible they know it does not matter how likable they are how personable they are if they are continuing on in their willful sin especially with the fornication and masturbation that's what paul's saying right here he's specifically honing in on the fornication because he knows that a lot of people that are continuing on in willful sin are continuing on in their sexual sin uh and this is what we see in thessalonians as well too in uh, first or second Thessalonians, I can't remember which one it is, but he pretty much told the entire church, you guys are doing a pretty good job, except for those who are fornicating among you. The Lord's going to punish those people, and he most definitely will if they continue on in their sin. Jude 1.4 says, there are certain men crept in unawares. So this is saying there's children of Satan that creep into your congregation unawares you don't know about. And you might be asking yourself the question, well, how do I know about them? Specifically with the leadership and the males in the congregation or fellowship or church, whatever setting it might be. Oh, and that's something else that I want to say. Just because it's not a church building does not mean these principles do not apply. Uh, this can apply anywhere. Any congregation is, you know, any congregation that's of God is the church of Jesus Christ. Church is not merely just a building. There's also another definition, which is the body of Jesus Christ. So wherever two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst. You know what I mean? So that's another form of congregation and church. So don't allow, you know, some uh, pastor that's a Catholic to say oh well this isn't officially a church so therefore I can just let sin run rampant in the congregation you don't want that happening either um, let's see it says who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God our Lord Jesus Christ uh, and this is definitely what happens guys oftentimes they come in with this cheap grace doctrine that you can just oh, well, it doesn't really matter, you know, I, I love the Lord, but they're continuing on in their willful sin. People that are continuing on in unrepentance oftentimes bring in this cheap grace doctrine because that's what they forfeit over to. Once they are not denying themselves, they sell out for a cheap grace doctrine. And oftentimes pe people like this are going to bring in that cheap grace doctrine and not only pollute your fellowship with sin, but also pollute your fellowship with uh, cheap grace doctrine, with you know, false doctrine as well, too. Uh, and it says they're crept in unawares. So you need to realize that there's nothing new under the sun. This is still happening nowadays. Um, what I was saying before, though, is even sometimes the leadership should be, should be asking people, like, you could be like uh, asking an individual, well, how's your walk with the Lord doing? Yeah, you overcoming sin? And the person says, no, well, I'm still struggling. And then you could say, well, you know, are you, are you committing these sins and so forth? I believe that the leadership should be asking people these kind of questions sometimes. And as well, too, I mean, you know, somebody who's who's not a good tree is not going to be bearing good fruit in the in the first place. So you can start to pick up signs and, and notice that way as well, too. A good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. So you don't want to be superstitious to the point where it's like, oh, what, well, everybody in this church that I'm walking into is probably living in willful sin. But yet at the same time, you don't want to just keep your guard down. You want to abide by these principles in the Bible. 1 Timothy 5.20 says, Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. And this is what I want to try to instill in my walk even that much more. Uh, I see pretty much no pastors that are running churches, physical church buildings, abiding by this principle. And it's so important to realize that repentance needs to be enforced. It's good when repentance is preached. It's even better when repentance is enforced. And if people are, if leaders are not kicking, um, they're not kicking willful sinners that are calling themselves Christians out of their congregation in their church, 
then repentance is not really being enforced to the point where it should be. Uh, many congregations will merely preach repentance, but they don't enforce it. Joel Osteen can tell you to repent, but that doesn't mean that he's enforcing it by any means. And um, like I said, enforcing it can definitely mean sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes to kick people out of your fellowship, to kick reprobates and false converts out of your fellowship. And uh, you can tell them, you can encourage them, say, I want you to repent, brother you know, or more specifically the leaders, I want you to repent. Uh, we love you, man, uh, but we cannot allow you to continue on in, in unrepentantness in our fellowship. You know what I mean? And uh, some people that are agents of Satan that are just trying to cloak themselves, uh, trying to camouflage into your fellowship, need to be rebuked before all that others may fear. And uh, that's a hard saying. That's a hard saying even my, in my life, but I want to try to apply these principles even that much more. The Lord's really been showing me a lot about this, and uh, I want to apply these principles even more so in my life. 1 Timothy 19-20 through 20 says, Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So these people were blaspheming, they were continuing on in their blaspheming, and Paul said, I delivered these people over that they may learn not to blaspheme. So Paul did this in his walk where he defellowshipped uh, people right here. We see with the example of Hymenaeus and Alexander, uh, and we see this with other instances, obviously with Je Jesus and Judas. You know, Jesus was not like, oh, it's fine that you, bet you betrayed me, uh, Judas. You want to be a part of the congregation? That's fine. No, he said to Judas, it would have been better if that person would have never been born. And uh, man, you know, that's that's pretty intense, right? Right there, if you really think about it uh, biblically. But yeah, like I was saying, we do see examples of this in the Bible. Uh, so we should look to these examples and put them into effect in our lives as well, too. And uh, if somebody that, that you're a part of their fellowship or their congregation, uh, they're not applying this principle whatsoever. I'm not saying inherently to leave the fellowship by any means, but it's definitely not a good sign. You know what I mean? Because I've seen it before where congregations or a church will get run over by Satan because, like I said, then the devil has that much more of a legal right to persecute the saints when the leaderships are allowing reprobates and false converts uh, just to freely fellowship, and they're not even enforcing repentance whatsoever. Now, like I said, somebody who's a babe in Christ or somebody who's bound by a demon, that's a different situation. You need to judge it based on the amount of knowledge the individual has, the amount of repentance that person has heard, if they've been rebuked before, and so forth. Not every instance is exactly the same, so you need to use discernment. You don't want to just go one too far on, on either end of the scale. You want to have balance. And uh, for those of you who follow my ministry, you know that I talk about balance quite a bit. That's what I try to walk in. But let's see, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 5, last verse that I wanted to read. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of the, thereof, from such turn away. So if somebody's denying the power of God, you are not to fellowship with them. When it says from such turn away, that definitely does not mean continue on in fellowship with them. So this could be not only people who are living in willful sin, but Roman Catholics, sensationists that say there's no power of God today, the gifts have ceased and so forth. Cheap gracers that deny the power of God. So pretty much anybody who's not bearing good fruit and walking in the power of God, you ultimately need to defellowship. Now there's people that are growing that yet don't have that much fruit. They're a babe in Christ or so forth. And you need to judge it based off that. You want to have grace with people yet at the same time. But yeah, there's a lot of people, you know, we should not be uh, fellowshipping with. A Roman Catholic's an idolater. Uh, a cessationist Baptist is somebody who denies the power uh, of God. And if somebody's saying, well, uh, I can just continue on in the sin. This is too hard for me to overcome. They're denying the power of God. They're de denying the power thereof. And the Bible says from such turn away. So you want to bring them the true doctrine. This is what I've found in my walk with counseling people and trying to help people overcome is if they're on this cheap grace doctrine, they're on a false doctrine or Roman Catholicism or cessationism, they need to get on the right doctrine first because if they stay in that false doctrine, that's going to allow them to continue on in sin. That's going to give them a license to sin in the midst of their temptation. They're going to push their conscience aside and say, oh, well, I won't go to hell for this sin, so... 
I could just do it anyways. You know what I mean? Uh, people with, that hold these false doctrines, when they're denying the power of, it keeps them in bondage to their sin even that much more. So you want to clearly state to them, hey man, this, this false doctrine is going to bring you to hell. You know what I mean? This is one of the major reasons why you're continuing on in your sin. Because in the midst of temptation, your demons are telling you it's okay because you believe in this doctrine. So you can definitely reach out to people, don't get me wrong. You can uh, reach out to people who are even who even call themselves Christians and are uh, you know living in willful sin, but you do not want to yoke up with them. You know what I mean? You can give them counsel to be able to overcome, uh, but you don't want to associate with people who say they believe in Jesus Christ, but they're living like a Satanist. The Bible says, from such turn away who deny the power of, with such a one not even to eat. Don't even associate with these people. These are pretty strict biblical principles, commandments, and yet we see the pretty much complete opposite going on nowadays where people are being way too lenient. Uh, so I hope this video can help some bring some balance out to that situation. Um, and like I said, if somebody's a babe in Christ or an unbeliever, they should have even that much more grace reached out to them with. They should have more grace as opposed to the individual who calls himself a Christian for 20 years and is still masturbating or is still lying or is still, uh, you know, drugging or so forth, right? I, I hope you understand the difference, you know what I mean? Judge it based upon how much knowledge that person has, based upon how much rebukes that person has had, and, uh, and go from there. And especially if if they're just unrepentant, they're stone cold when you rebuke them their sin, sin, when you tell them they're going to go to hell if they continue on in this sin, if they're just stone cold or they react with some cheap grace doctrine, you know, they should be rebuked and defellowshipped even that much more quicker. So that's pretty much all that I have to say for this video, guys. I hope it was eye-opening to you. Reading through 1 Corinthians 5 has really been eye-opening to me about defellowshipping people who call themselves Christians that are living in sin. And um, yeah, just pray to the Lord about it. Ask Him for discernment. You know, if you are somebody who's still yet a babe in Christ or, or maybe a woman, you know, you can even approach your leadership and be like, is this something that you hold, you know, in your congregation where you're not usurping the pastor, you're not usurping the leadership? You can approach the leadership and be like, hey, I see that repentance is not really being enforced in this area. These people are openly confessing that they're living in sin and they're not repenting and they're not being defellowshipped. What's going on with that? You know what I mean? And you can bring these principles to the leadership of the congregation and be like, you know, what's going on here? And hopefully try to reach out to them like that. And I know this is definitely something that I want to start to do uh, that I haven't done before. So, uh, yeah. Anyways, guys, I hope that, that helps you as well, too. Uh, if you have questions about this topic, you could ask me and be blessed in Jesus' name.